Okay, it's five o'clock, so let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to Save Speaker Series. My name is Orlando Gonzalez. I'm the Executive Director of Safeguarding American Values for Everyone, also known as SAVE. Uh, my pronouns are he and him, he, him, and his. Um, before we begin, I just want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Right now, we're launching a poll to better understand who is in attendance today. The responses to this poll are anonymous, so don't worry about uh, you being identified with your answers. Uh, all the participants in this audience today are muted, except for the presenters, so we can't hear you. Uh, but at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to take questions and we'll be able to answer them. So you can submit questions throughout the entire presentation and then what we'll do is queue those up and members of the panel will be able to respond. Uh, to submit questions on your toolbar on Zoom, it's either on the bottom or on the top, depending if you're a Mac user, an iPad user, or uh, whatever platform it may be, there is a button, this Q&A. Click on that button and, be, and you can submit questions to us. If you've joined us on Facebook Live, you can only listen in on the conversation and you can submit questions. So if you want to be participating a little bit more interactively through the poll and also with questions, please uh, join us on the Zoom. So the work of SAVE is supported by individuals, corporate sponsors, and philanthropic grants. Right now, we're at the end of a fundraising campaign. So tonight, April 30th, is the deadline for the campaign through the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Every dollar that you donate, to save through the Florida AIDS Walk is matched dollar for dollar. You can make a donation through, oh, there's a notification telling me I'm supposed to be here. I'm here. Uh, you can make a donation uh, uh, through save.lgbt backslash FAW 2020. I'll repeat that the FAW stands for Florida AIDS Walk. So save.lgbt backslash FAW 2020. So to get us started, uh, I'm going to turn to SAVE Vice Chair Board of Directors, Travis Randall. Travis, you're on mute. Let's see. Uh, there you are. Thank, hey. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando, and welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you are with us today. Uh, my name is Travis Randolph. I am the Vice Chair of, of SAVE. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. SAVE's mission is to promote, protect, and defend equality for people in South Florida who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. I first got involved in SAVE uh, right before um, the Equal Marriage Amendment was passed here in uh, Florida. Um, I was proud to be part of an organization that was ahead of the curve as far as the rest of the nation and promoting the fact that love is love and it does not depend on gender or who you are with. Um, and just ever since that time, I just been just a part of all the strides that we've made and all of the you know, effects that we've had on the community at both the local and state level. Um, today's speaker series is intended to provide you with an understanding of SAVE's endorsement process and to answer any questions that you may have. Our endorsements are a core program of SAVE. In fact, when SAVE was founded uh, as a PAC, a candidate endorsement was the primary purpose. We do our work by engaging with elected officials and that process and relationship beginning begins with our endorsements. Uh, Pro-equality legislation and defending the LGBT community is accomplished when we have pro-equality candidates in office at all levels. Now, we are asking you to please respond to the poll uh, so that we can show the response in about, uh, in about a minute. Uh, our agenda today includes a review of the 2020 elections, and insight into the policy areas to highlight what's at stake. Um, we are also going to have a review of the candidate endorsement process here at SAVE, the criteria that we use to make an endorsement and make endorsement decisions. Uh, following that, we'll have a look at the what happens after, which is um, what happens after an endorsement is announced. You know, we depend heavily on community volunteers, which we will share to you, with you information on how to get involved and how to be a part of that volunteer process uh, on our endorsement panels. Uh, lastly, we'll have a Q&A session. And um, just um, as I've said earlier, uh, to submit questions, please use the Q&A button in the Zoom toolbar. Uh, we're going to close the poll here in a minute and begin our presentation. And I turn it back over to you, Orlando. Orlando, I think you're still on mute. 
There we go. Sorry about that. This is uh, one of those things you have to get used to, right? Um, well, let's go ahead and close the poll. Um, be able to look at who is in the room and be able to uh, share those results with everyone. So uh, overwhelmingly, we have a room full of uh, pro-quality voters <clears throat> and some pro-quality candidates who are going to be running for office, so they have a vested interest in learning more about our process today. Um, we have 62% um, of the participants are male, 38% are female. Um, sexual orientation, a majority of the people in the room are identified as gay, uh, followed by uh, members of the straight community, uh, the lesbian community, bisexual and pansexual. So that's the, the breakdown that we have. The next one is a question about gender identity. And so the majority of the respondents on here are 71% uh, cisgender. And then uh, the next question we ask is if you've already signed up to be a panelist uh, with SAVE. Um, and a great number of our panelists are joining us today. So we've got 12 uh, individuals or 57% of people that responded that they are already signed up to be panelists. So I wanna thank you for being a part of that process. If you've already been able to be on a panel, you know what it's like. Those of you who are new to the process, you're gonna learn more today. Uh, but I think that nothing beats like uh, being in the hot seat when you're actually participating in an interview and you're there with the candidates and you're involved in the discussion. So that's uh, always a wonderful moment. The last question I threw in is just a little bit of a bonus because I think it speaks to some of our civic responsibilities that we have right now, which is to respond to the 2020 census. Your response to the census means uh, what kind of funding, federal funding we receive in our community. So um, let's turn now to what we have in front of our slides and talk about the 2020 uh, endorsement cycle. Uh, in here, we have about 29 races, which will translate into about 90 candidates that are going to be uh, presenting to us uh, during the uh, process. Um, in this process, that means when I say 90 candidates, that also means that SAVE is going to facilitate 90 individual and separate interviews. So uh, it could be more, it could be a little less, but that's really what we're estimating right now, and that's what we see uh, taking place. So this includes key LGBT supportive candidates at the U.S. Congress with the Florida Senate and House races, the local Miami-Dade County mayor and commissioners. Um, and of course, since, since the county recently adopted term limits, this is going to be the largest turnover ever that we will see at the county commission level. So that's uh, going to be a big turnover of many races, and uh, we've got that to look at. Uh, the state attorney's race also includes a first time challenge to that seat in many years, as well as the school board and then two local races uh, that will be coming up as well. So this is all, all of what we have right now for the first set of races that are coming up in August. This will make up the first set of races that we're gonna be endorsing on and we'll be interviewing. And many of the races that are in August because they are primary, there are primaries, we'll have a little bit of a down select, and then some of those will continue into the, Nove into the November election. So in the November election, of course, we have uh, the US presidential race. I'm sure that everyone has heard about that particular race. Uh, we have the race, of course, for the US Congress, um, several seats that uh, comprise South Florida. Again, state Florida races, Miami-Dade County Commission races, school board, and other municipal races. Um, just like I said earlier, many of the races that we're going to see in November stem from being runoffs of some of the races in August. So those will be continuations. Uh, I'm going to turn now over to Dustin Kletcha. He's the Deputy Director uh, at SAVE, somebody that I'm very uh, grateful for. He takes care of a lot of our uh, policy matters with the organization is, and is often uh, the Wizard of Oz in the background doing a lot of things, and I'm just really appreciative of him. So, Justin, I'll turn this over now to you. Thanks, Orlando. It's, uh, it's a little strange being on this side of the, the webinar and not just hiding out in the background, uh, push, pushing buttons. <laughs> um, there's so much, so much at stake uh, this year. Um, um, and, and we definitely just can't go into everything that's at stake with the, the presidential race, but um, more specifically on the federal level, we're looking at quite a few different bills that could progress uh, LGBTQ equality. Um, the Equality Act, uh, this Congress, the 116th Congress, has passed the House, but again has stalled in the Senate, and that's a comprehensive federal non-discrimination law. Um, 
the Do No Harm Act is aimed at fixing the 1993 Religious Freedom and Restoration Act, which was one of the most bipartisan bills ever passed in, in Congress. Uh, unfortunately, you know, over the past two decades, where it was really meant to protect uh, religious groups um, from, from certain laws, it's been used to discriminate and uh, discriminate against LGBT people. Um, so the Do No Harms Act would prohibit discrimination under the guise of religious freedom. Uh, there's still some issues going around about uh, adoption and adoption agencies that get federal money and if they're allowed to discriminate or not. Uh, and that's in the works to be cleaned up. Um, over the past uh, four years, we've seen LGBTQ international efforts really decline. So there's a movement to make sure that we have special envoys uh, and people within the State Department that are, are looking at other countries' policies and how we interact with them, uh, and if they're inclusive of LGBT people or, or hostile. Uh, the transgender military ban, um, while much of that is an executive order, there are there is a bill in Congress um, to uh, rectify that situation and just put an end to it um, so that trans folks can serve uh, openly in the military. Um, expanding PrEP access and making sure that more insurance are mandated to cover it uh, is a big issue. And then uh, last but not least, um, a federal ban on conversion therapy. So looking at taking away the licenses of people that, that practice this, this harmful um, uh, sham treatment. And then um, at the federal level, unfortunately, we have to revisit hate, line, hate crimes. There was a recent court ruling that push the law to say that um, it's only a hate crime if the sole motivation for the attack or the murder was was uh, malice towards uh, any given group. Um, and that's not, not the spirit of uh, the, the law. On the state level, we still have a lot of work to do. A lot of it mirrors what we need to do on the federal level, but um, we always want these laws layered uh, so that multiple governments can intervene. So we still need to pass a statewide non-discrimination ban, ban conversion therapy, uh, and we need to update our, our HIV uh, criminalization laws. Right now, um, there's some very stiff penalties around disclosure, and we know that those penalties are increasing stigma and reducing treatment and testing um, and furthering the epidemic, especially here in South Florida. Uh, we also need to update our, uh, the way that our judicial nominating committees select judges when there's a vacancy. Right now, the process is incredibly, incredibly political and puts all the power in the hands of the governor. Uh, and that was not the intent of, of JNCs when they were created. Uh, last but not least, on the state level, um, there currently is no state hate crime protections for trans folks. Um, so uh, based on sexual orientation, if there's an attack, that can be elevated to a hate crime, but not for, for gender identity or expression. Um, well, there's a lot of stuff we want to do on the local level. The most pressing is going to be continuing to pass conversion therapy bans and convert single stall restrooms to gender neutral facilities. Uh, and there's also a lot of, uh, at stake that involves uh, anti LGBT legislation, right? At the, the federal level, well, fortunately, progressives control uh, the, the House of Representatives. Um, we're seeing more and more executive orders that allow government agencies and contractors to uh, discriminate based on, on religious grounds. Um, so having a new administration will, will go a long ways in changing that. And same thing with the, the Do No Harm Act. Um, Title IX and Title VII are both at stake. They're both in front of the courts right now. Title IX is non-discrimination uh, in education, and Title VII is an employment under the Obama administration the guidance um, was that sex covered sexual orientation and gender identity. The Trump administration has taken that away. Um, and so while we'll see the, the Supreme Court make some decisions on that, um, if, and if the administration doesn't change, this is going to be an ongoing battle. At the state level, um, we're always vigilant of relig new religious refusal laws. Uh, this past session, we were fortunate enough not to see any. Um, but we did see a slew of preemption laws. Um, both of these types of, of laws are, are similar in that they're not always necessarily targeted at LGBT people, but they're written so poorly and so vaguely that the unintended consequences have a large impact on the, on the community.
for example, HB 305 preempted cities and counties from enacting laws that um, um, prevented employers from, from making rules for, for employees. Um, and while it was targeted at our friends in labor, um, the, the unintended consequences of that bill is that it would have erased every single local non-discrimination ordinance in the state. And last but not least, um, we continue to see overtly anti-trans bills. This past uh, year, there was an effort uh, in a couple states um, to ban medical professionals from providing gender-affirming treatments to, to minors. Um, that bill did not move in Florida, luckily, uh, but it did pass in, in South Dakota. Great, thank you, Justin. I, you know, I, I really wanted to make sure that today's presentation highlighted some of the policy areas that are impacted because a lot of times when people come to us and we're talking about positions that we are voting on for an endorsement, you can sort of look at that race just sort of in an isolated stovetop and you think that it's really just about candidate A and candidate B, but really what it is, it's, it's about public policy and the way that public policy impacts our community and that's the most important thing that we need to keep an eye on. So when members of the panel have a debate and a discussion about which panelist or which candidate to endorse, oftentimes what we bring into the conversation is, uh, you know, exactly the question about which of these persons is going to be able to advance a policy position or be able to help protect our community the best, the most, etc. Um, so, so that's really helpful. I saw that there was a question that came through earlier and I want to just uh, 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 answer those two right away. This presentation will be distributed to everybody, so you'll be able to see this afterwards and, and keep it for, for discussion and even for point of reference later on. The second is we can't see you. The only people that are visible uh, are the presenters that are on here. Um, we can see your names listed and we can see your questions come through. So uh, there's no uh, video capability for members of the audience. So just wanted to be able to have uh, that for you. So our endorsement process, uh, there are six steps uh, in what seems like a pretty uh, linear process, right? There's a point A and a point, uh, you know, D or whatever the sixth letter in the alphabet is, that is pretty straightforward. Um, so the way that all this begins is that it starts with um, the staff, members of the endorsement committee and members of the board who identify the elections that we want to be able to be involved in. So we see the election schedule ahead of time and we start to look through the list and we think about that within the context of what we spoke to a little while ago with this policy. Which of these races are involved in policy areas that we're really concerned about in order to advance equality for our community. Um, then there's a qualifying period. Really, it's kind of a, a deadline. It's a hard line when members who are interested uh, in running for a race submit their applications to uh, the Board of Elections and they become uh, qualifying candidates for the election. That means that they're going to show up on the ballot. They're going to be they're going to be there. We're going to be able to see them. And so when we see that list, we take everybody who's in the list and we send them a questionnaire. So that questionnaire is their invitation to become a part of the process. Now, I say this, that it goes to everybody. You can imagine that some people choose not to respond. Some people say, you know, I have nothing to do with that community. I have, I don't even want their endorsement. And that's totally fine with us. But we start by saying to everybody, here's our questionnaire. Please respond if you're interested. And that begins the process of engagement. Um, when a questionnaire is returned, that is a signal to us, of course, that the person is interested in participating. And then what we do at that moment is then we invite them to be a part of the interview. So we start looking at schedules and we start to put together uh, the actual interview time when, when we're able to sit with the candidates and be able to uh, um, engage them in an interview process. When that interview takes place, members that are members of the community that have come together uh, are there, they, they listen to all the candidates in a particular race and they take a vote. Their vote is where this process really becomes uh, a, a marker in time where a disposition is developed. So the panelists, members of the community, uh, make a recommendation to endorse or to not endorse, and that recommendation then goes up to an endorsement committee. The endorsement committee uh, looks at the decision that's been made by the panelists. Uh, members of the staff provide 
uh, talking points that were developed during the discussion, right? The panelists might have sat there and very formally said, this is the list of pros, this is the list of cons. We share those openly with the committee so that we can, again, continue to elevate the conversation about what went on during the discussion. Uh, the endorsement committee then uh, ratifies that decision um, and then it goes up to our board of directors and the board of directors then uh, you know, uh, approves the endorsement or ratifies the endorsement. I say all this that it sort of goes up to different levels really because it's a really good uh, way to have uh, checks and balances in terms of the way that the entire process flows out. I'll say that many times that a lot changes from the moment it starts at the panelist and it goes all the way up, something really strange out in the environment has to happen in order for things to change. I put an asterisk at the bottom of this because I want to make it very clear that members of the staff have no vote in the process. Justin and I are facilitators of this process to make it as fair as possible, to make it as open as possible, really to bring everything in in a way that helps uh, build inclusion in the discussion of what we are doing. So um, that is our endorsement process with six steps. There is a different process that we take whenever we have uh, incumbents that are in a race. So with incumbents that are in a ra race, um, we have a, a shorter process instead of a bridge process. What happens here is that whenever we have uh, any candidates that are running for re-election, we uh, choose to, through the, through the, again, through the staff, the endorsement committee and the board, develop consensus around whether or not we want to issue the abridged process. Those individuals who are already incumbents, we send them an application to check with them if they're interested in our endorsement again. And then from there, we review their application and immediately the endorsement committee is then able to go to a vote. And then following that, it goes to the, to, to the board vote. So you'll see that this is a much more, uh, it's a shorter process, it's abridged. Um, and we do this for many reasons. And that is that many of our um, incumbent endorsed members are people that we are already building a relationship with around policy areas that we are working with them, uh, hand in glove really to really you know, do the most that we can to be able to advance uh, public policy. So if we're already on a track to be able to get a bill moved and to get policy moved, then we wanna be able to pursue that in a way that supports the incumbent's path to victory for us and for them. Um, Justin, is there anything else that you would add in terms of my description of the two processes? You're, you're the pro in this space, and I just uh, want to make sure that I didn't leave out anything important. Uh, no, that's, that's the process in a nutshell. I would say under very, very special circumstances, the committee and the board have the option to, to forego the process, but that's very, very rare. Um, I think the last time that we saw that in a big way was the endorsement of our, our champion, David Richardson, when he ran for Congress in 2018. So it's not something that happens for, uh, you know, just, just any, not even just any strong, strong, truly strong champion of equality. Um, you have to be on, on David Richardson's level to, to get some sort of special, special treatment. Thanks. Examples, I think, are always helpful in terms of being able to contextualize that. That really helps. Um, so that's the process. It's two in a nutshell. Um, to borrow your words, uh, let's go on to the next process. Great. So let's talk a little bit more about what what the panels look like and what that process uh, is really a couple of weeks before and leading up to the actual interviews. Um, so the, the, the panels consist of community volunteers and board members. We have uh, an ongoing list of people that are interested. So if you've not signed up, there'll be a link at the end of this presentation so you can get on that email list um, um, with opportunities to start as soon as uh, the week of May 15th, I believe is gonna be our first round of interviews for the year starting with the judiciary. Um, and so how that works is everybody on that list um, once an interview is scheduled, they're invited to, to opt in um, and folks get assigned on a, a first come first serve basis. Um, we really found that five to seven volunteers uh, is about the limit. Um, so we try not to go, go over seven so everybody gets a chance to participate um, and engage, but then less than five, it seems a little, little lopsided. So um, that's, that's the sweet spot to have a really good panel with a, plurality of different views and, and voices. Um,
Um, so one of the biggest parts about those those panels um, is that nobody on the panel is allowed to have a conflict of interest, uh, and that's whether it's real or perceived, right? And we consider a lot of things to be a conflict of interest. We want our panels really to make sure that they they have the best interest of the community uh, and save um, at mind when they, when they come to these panels. So a few examples is um, if, you, if you donated to a candidate, um, you are absolutely not allowed to be on that panel. Uh, that's a pretty uh, hard line, um, similar to, to volunteering or contributing any other way to the candidate's campaign. Um, and then where it gets a little bit harder to distinguish is uh, if you have a close personal or professional relationship, you know, with a candidate, um, and that really comes down to the committee and the panel's chair uh, to their discretion on if it's disqualifying or not. Uh, it looks like my video just went out. Um, Dustin, we can uh, hear you even though your video's out. Perfect, I'll keep on going then. Um, you know, a great example of um, where it's a gray area, especially as we interview these judges, um, you know, a lot of our committee members and board members and volunteers that are especially interested in, in judicial races are, are lawyers, right? Um, so, you know, if you've worked with somebody that's running for office before, that's a big red line. Um, but, you know, if it's a, an incumbent judge that you've appeared in front of before, um, you know, we, we want you to disclose it and, you know, make the best decision possible with the committee chair and the staff on if it makes sense for you to, to continue on those panels. Want to move to the the next slide? Thirty. There's a brief training and time for folks to review the questionnaires that we'll be interviewing. Most typical nights consist of four to five candidates. Um, every candidate. Uh, and any given race has to be interviewed by the same the same panel, right? You know, if you have five five people interview one candidate and five different people interview the, a, a different candidate for the same race, there's no way for them to be able to vote on whether we should endorse the candidate or not because they didn't hear from both of the candidates. Um, so every candidate gets approximately 30 minutes to, to be interviewed by the panel. Um, it seems like a long time, but it actually goes by pretty quickly. And what the panel is really looking for are a handful of key criteria, right? Um, does the candidate support the policy initiatives that we want to move forward with um, that are listed on the questionnaire? And if, if they don't support all of them, we want to have a conversation to figure out where that line is. Um, but also they want to Hey, Justin, I think we lost you. Um, Justin, uh, we lost both your video and your connection. So let's go ahead and um, you come back into the conversation. Let's see, I see some movement there. You're muted. It was just a couple of seconds and we'll see if we can overcome this technical uh, difficulty here, just a sec. Yeah, I think he is out for a couple of minutes. So, if, Justin, if you can hear me, just drop out and come back into the conversation, and then we'll pick up from here. Uh, I'm going to go into the next uh, slide really quickly, and then we'll turn back to Justin uh, on the next presentation. So, um, there's a question that comes up often about, you know, what do we do for somebody when we issued an endorsement? So, when we issued an endorsement, as you see uh, in the graphic that we've displayed here, right, we've got the um, graphic of David Richardson, where we indicate that we're gonna be issuing an endorsement and we populate this out throughout our email and through social media and our website, really just at the, at the basic level, indicating that this person uh, is being endorsed by the Save Action Pack. The candidate throughout their campaign process is allowed to use that logo uh, to indicate that they are a candidate that's being endorsed uh, by the organization. So that is broad-based, it's what we do for everybody. What we do in cases where we have a candidate who's a strong supporter but starts to uh, experience uh, much more competition from somebody who is 
uh, you know, strong opponent to uh, the community, somebody who could harm the community, then we start to look at making greater investments into the candidate, right? So we start to assemble volunteers and we start to do some phone banking on behalf of the candidate. Uh, if we have to take it up a notch and do a little bit more and, and then start to be able to do um, more work, uh, we can then be able to do some work around canvassing, going going door to door, knocking on uh, the doors of voters, being able to try to garner more support and to garner more, more votes. Um, this is the work really that SAVE is most known for by putting boots on the ground, knocking on doors and being able to connect with voters to be able to bring them uh, to the voting box to make a decision that uh, supports pro-equality candidates. Um, taking it up another notch, then if we have to do an investment in digital ads to be able to pay, to be able to distribute the message that these candidates are pro-equality candidates, then we continue to do that. And again, of course, um, if the candidate is in need of some more financial support, we'll go out into the community and start to raise funds specifically for that person's race. And so um, that is how our investment increases whenever there is greater opposition, whenever the candidate that we've chosen to endorse needs to be amplified even more. So it starts really at a very broad base, but we go in even harder and more aggressively uh, when we have to. Um, Justin, I think, let's do a sound check. Are you back on? I am, I am. Awesome, I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. I see your videos on, but that's totally cool. Uh, you're on, so if you wanna complete the discussion about the panel interview process, let's do that. Uh, fantastic, so I mean, more and more, we're, we're very fortunate that every candidate that interviews, right, is, is fully supportive. Um, so we start looking at, you know, three other areas, and that's, you know, are they going to be a good public servant? Why are they running? Uh, what's their motivation? How do they view holding public office? Uh, and this is important for every race, um, but extremely important for judicial candidates, right? Because we cannot ask judicial candidates how they think they would rule in any particular case, right? It's unethical for them to make an assumption before they hear the facts. Um, so we really dive into to their motivations um, and, and on what it means to, to serve. Um, the next piece is, um, you know, folks might look the same on paper, but, you know, when we endorse, we don't want just a, a yes vote for us in the future or someone that's going to, you know, vote with us on our policies. Um, we want, we want people that are going to champion our policies, be the sponsors and be the driving force of, of getting our bills and ordinances passed at, at all level of government. Um, and then last but not least, um, you know, do they have a path to, to victory? Is is viability of their campaign something that that's that's possible, right? You know, if you're running in a state house race and the most you're gonna raise is five thousand dollars, chances are you really don't have a good chance at winning a winning those races, right? Those races at a minimum you need to raise about forty, fifty thousand dollars at least on the low end. Um and part of that, regardless of how passionate you are about LGBT issues, um, when we endorse somebody, if you don't have a path to victory, we're burning political capital and making an enemy with somebody that we don't, we don't have to. Um, so generally, if those races um, occur and, well, we have some really passionate folks that don't have a, a chance and the other person didn't interview, we often decline to endorse in those types of races. Uh, and more and more, especially at the local level, what we're seeing is that candidates are really equal across the board. You know, we just, we just interviewed in uh, the South Miami mayor's race. Um, we're a very small town down here. Uh, I think we have 8,000 regi regi uh, registered voters. Um, so the viability bar is pretty, pretty easy to pass when it's a 20% turnout, you know, um, money isn't that big of an issue for such a small town. And the panel really dived in on, on quality of life issues, right? What are the other issues that are affecting the city? You know, uh, most municipalities are, are always looking at preservation versus development, uh, traffic issues, other things that affect the community on a day-to-day -day basis are taken into account when the candidates are equal on overt LGBTQ issues. Thanks, Justin. So I just wanna be able to put another fine point on how important and how seriously we take the issue of conflict of interest. Um, 
It's something that we address from the minute the invitation goes out to be able to be a part of the panel. Uh, so these questions about, you know, whether or not uh, how close you are to the candidate and whether or not you've made a financial contribution. That question starts there. When the panel is assembled, the question comes up again. And so we continue to emphasize how much we can sort of, um, uh, not sort of, how much we, we, we need to make the room uh, as free of, of bias as possible. And so we take that uh, really seriously. And the other point that I want to make, just to add uh, uh, another fine point, is that um, more and more um, we are becoming less and less single issue voters, right? Just like Justin said, we have seen panels where everybody on the panel is very supportive of the community and we start to look at issues that are more related to quality of life issues. And so we're gonna to continue to see that, but what will continue to happen is that SAVE will continue to assemble the LGBT and ally community as a strong force that gets organized, that, that has a voice and, and, a, and a place in elections, that we are always sort of the, the, the viable, political group that comes to the forefront really to, to bring forth issues that are really important to us. Um, I spoke already uh, about the issues of, or the topics of what happens after we've made an endorsement. Of course, the bigger the threat, the more the investment that we make. Um, how to get involved? Well, you know, I've said this a couple of times, uh, but I wanna be able to, to emphasize this more and more this year. Um, it is so important for you to vote. But that's not all that we need from you. So it's not just about you voting. It's about you being part of the canvassing process. It's about you getting more and deeper involved. And so we need everybody in the community to be involved at levels like you've never seen before. Um, you know, if you're gonna go vote, make sure you're taking a friend with you or asking people if they've already voted. And if they haven't, bring them with you. Um, because of the current threat that we are under, given the need for social distancing, we don't know what August and, and November is gonna look like. So proactively go online and sign up to vote by mail. Um, and like I mentioned, become a panelist, volunteer with us, and also become a member of SAVE. You know, the, the investment that you make in becoming a member of SAVE really helps us continue to do this kind of work and continues to help us organize around uh, the elections and to do the work that is necessary. Uh, Justin, I'll kick it over to you. Uh, fantastic. So I just wanted to take a minute and recognize and thank our our endorsement committee. Um, the amount of hours that these volunteers put in, um, especially in even numbered years, is uh, just just astounding, right? You know, they're they're chairing our committee or our panels uh, multiple times a week over the course of months, right? We're going to start interviewing in May. We're not going to stop interviewing until about the first week in October to get through all of these races that are happening this year. Um, and it's not just the interviews, right? After they um, they come in and they chair the panel or they participate in the panel, um, we have them back on the phone uh, for a conference call to, to ratify these um, the endorsements. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for for all the hard uh, work that you put in, Abby. I'm sorry I spelled your name wrong, um, but um, very very thankful that you come on as, as the committee chair for this cycle. Um, you know, Nancy Lee Conter, who's not on the, the, the phone right now, is the vice chair uh, and also a board member. Paul Thomas, Travis Randolph, our vice chair, who's with us today. Jonathan Frieden, uh, the past committee chair and the current chair of the board. Manuel Negron, uh, Beth Hitt, and Helena Castro um, have all just put in um, uh, uh, a very high number of hours over the past uh, couple years working on making sure that our endorsements run smoothly um, um, and we make the right choices. Thanks, Justin. So, you know, I know that there's a lot of members of our endorsement panel that are on the call today, and, and, and we say this all the time, but, but I want to say it again because it's an open invitation. If you have experience on the panel and you want to be able to uh, amplify your volunteerism and be a member of the committee, let us know that you're interested in taking a, a greater leadership role by getting more involved and that uh, we can then uh, move you up into being a member of the committee. Um, you will see the very natural tra trajectory that occurs where people become involved as members of the, of the panel. They then become members of the committee and then they graduate become members of our board. Um, and that's, that's a very natural way to get involved. That's how I got involved back in uh, 2005 and um, here I am today. Um, so it's time for us to take questions from members of the audience. Um, some questions have already come through. 
Uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, we've got some wonderful members of the board and guests with us who are gonna help answer some of these questions. We have Abby Corbett, Travis Randolph, and Jonathan Frieden. Um, so if you guys can go off mute, what I'll do is I'll just start from the top and start reading these questions and you can decide uh, how you wanna answer them. And of course, Justin and I are here and available to help answer some of those questions. So this is, a, this is a great question. It's actually probably for Dustin. Um, so uh, thank you, Don, for submitting the question. It says, how often have panelists, have panel votes been overruled by the committee or the board has rejected a unanimous vote of the panel? So how often has that happened? Uh, you know, in any given cycle, we get up to about 100, 120 endorsements. And I think I've seen it happen once in the six years that I've been running the, the endorsement process, um, it's been returned to the panel three or four times, um, but only once has it actually been uh, rejected. And the way the process works is that if the committee or the board decline to ratify the endorsement, um, they present the, the panel, the original panel, with the new information and their reasoning and ask them to reconsider. Uh, and per our bylaws and procedures, um the panel votes again and that goes back to the committee goes back to the board at the end of the day um if the board still wants to reject the endorsement they they can only nullify it the board is not allowed to change the endorsement right so if if you know the panel voted to endorse orlando gonzalez and the board said no the board couldn't decide to endorse me over over orlando because the panel had, had said orlando and that's very likely with that kind of <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. That that's I think the explanation is helpful. Um, in my experience, uh, I had only seen it once in the period between 2005 and 2010, and the reason being is that the panel interview occurred, and then the board vote occurred at some other point in time. But in between. There was a controversy in the newspaper about uh, the candidate, and so things in the environment changed, and so we had to pause and, and, and kick it back to the panel to reconsider, given what had happened, and it was an ethics question that had that had taken place. And so, um, you know, when the process started and it was moving down the pike, it had to come back just because of that question that came up, and as a matter of of uh, that very public ethics discussion that was taking place. So that was one moment. Um, uh, and that was back in, I think, either 2007 or 8. Uh, I'm going to go to another question here by Bill. Um, the question here is, it sounds like the incumbents are more favored than perhaps they should be. Uh, I understand the champion idea, but it seems that there might be uh, an opportunity for a new candidate that may be equally favorable. How do we ensure in those races that incumbents aren't always favored? I can try to answer that if you want, Orlando, since I haven't spoken sure, yet. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Abby Corbett. Um, so th that's a great question. First of all, to be to be extra clear, the incumbents, it, this is we're talking about the abridged process applying to incumbents who we've endorsed before and who in the course of their role um, have continued to, in fact, deliver on what we expected from the previous endorsement. However, your point, Bill, is well taken. Uh, it's just an abridged process. It's not an automatic process. They still submit a questionnaire. It's still considered uh, by the committee. The only real difference is the panel. There isn't a panel. However, there can be a panel um, between staff and the committee. There can be a decision that, you know what, th this, this particular scenario, like the example you gave, the, the opponent looks like a really shining star, potentially too. This is not an automatic thing. Um, we can absolutely convene a panel for those scenarios. Anything to add to that, Jonathan or Travis? I'll add to it. Hi, everybody. Jonathan Frieden here. Um, you know that this is one thing that the endorsement committee spends a lot of time on discussing, and we don't go into it blindly. You know, we have, you know, we're fully educated on what the the races are all looking like, and Justin and Orlando do a great job of surveying the field and telling the committee and the board what we're going to be looking at in the election and so um you know certainly it's not an automatic thing i think as everybody has said uh so you know we're, we're comfortable with the process now it certainly was a concern 
at certain points when we were discussing certain incumbents. But overall, I think we do a really good job of making sure that we put aside uh, and we don't use this, I guess maybe we don't abuse this uh, incumbent reendorsement process. But like Abby said, you know, these is, it's reserved for people who have gotten our endorsement in the past and who maintain their relationship with us and the LGBTQ community um, and really proven themselves uh, throughout their time in office. Thank you, Abby and Jonathan. Um, so our next question comes from Felix and it, the question is, have we ever had a pro-equality candidate had their endorsement rescinded? I have a vague recollection of it happening once many years ago. I think before Justin's time, um, uh, Orlando, you might have been around at the time. And as I recall, I actually don't remember the candidate, uh, but as I recall, it was one of those scenarios where there was an intervening event that was very dramatic. Um, that's the only scenario. Yeah, I think I it's the one that I was talking about, Abby, where the panel voted yes. And then in the trajectory as it was going to the board, the very public ethical issue took place and so, so um, there was a change in what had occurred. And that was 2007 or eight, like I said, so it's, it's been a long time since we've had that. Let's go to the next one. So the next one is the same ever endorsed more than one candidate in a given race. I'll start really quick by adding to that. So we, we talk about this topic all the time. And there's, there's strategy, I think, that's involved here, right? So one of the things that we're sometimes concerned with is if we endorse two people, right, do we split the vote of the community and then make a third person win? So that's something that we think about. Or do we endorse uh, a slate of, of, like, let's say we endorse two people, does that help us eliminate maybe all of the other candidates that exist. So let's take, for example, you know, if you look at all the number of Democratic presidential candidates that we that were on the, the slate for a while, right? If there was a, an endorsement for two people, would that help just eliminate the whole litany of people that were already on the roster and just kind of leave it up to the two strongest for LGBT people? It really depends on the race. Um, and we take those decisions always very carefully, thinking about what will happen by doing the double endorsement and also what will happen if we don't endorse anybody. So we have those discussions all the time and they come up on a case by case basis. I don't know if other members of the board, uh, the committee or staff uh, wanna add to, to what I just said. I'll, I'll add, you know, it, it does happen. We have done it in the past. It's just, it's not the normal and, um, and we try not to do that. There are some, especially uh, local races, where you know the the top three vote getters get into office so there, there's that kind of situation which i don't think you're uh talking about um but but there are certain situations it's not usually favored because uh we know you know how important our endorsement is and and you know we know how you know it's kind of sometimes the candidates you know don't don't i mean it's kind of pointless for them to get an endorsement and their their uh, their uh, opponent gets the same endorsement too. So we try not to, but sometimes there's situations where it's the absolute right thing to do. Thanks. Uh, is there any more to add there? Uh, so the yeah, next just question to, is to give a, go ahead. Just to get, just to give a, a quick example um, where that happened in, in a non-municipal situation. In 2016, we co-endorsed uh, Jose Javier Rodriguez and Miguel Diaz de la Portilla for Senate District 37. It was an incredibly tough decision. Uh, JJR was an incredibly, has been an incredibly strong supporter when he was in the House, was running for the Senate. Um, you know, and, and DLP Miguel um, uh, changed his mind over it. You know, he, he changed, uh, he evolved on the LGBTQ issues you know, over his 20 years in office from the county commission then to the Senate. Um, and really any, he is the only person that's ever given us a vote at the state level on non-discrimination laws. 
Uh, and it was just an impossible choice to, to snub somebody that had changed their mind, but given us the only vote that we'd ever gotten on non-discrimination versus a, a champion that has been with us, um, you know, from the beginning. Thank you again. I think the examples continue to highlight how real these become when we make these decisions, because they, there really is a lot to consider in terms of the context in which they occur within policy, right? When, once you root all this in policy and what, what we're able to achieve, everything changes. Um, so there's a, there's a process question here. Uh, if a board member is voting on the endorsement committee, do they vote again at the board level or do they recuse themselves? I can answer that. Um, for, for those people who are on both, they typically vote twice, unless they, of course they had a, a conflict reason to recuse themselves, which you know happens occasionally. Uh, it's very rare by the time it gets to that point that it's a, a close call though. Um, but by the way, Orlando, um, anybody could follow up on that if they want to, but you dismissed, uh, the previous question was actually two parts and we didn't get a chance to answer the second part of that last question. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I just dismissed it. Well, do you, what was the question? Did you, did you sure. see that? Um, right. Yes, I think I can still see it. Okay, the question was, uh, the, Yes. what's the process for an incumbent judge running for retention who was appointed by the governor and thus not in a position to have been endorsed previously. So two things. One, the, the the bridge process is only for people who've been previously endorsed um, by SAVE and, and meet other criteria. Um, and then also, Justin and Orlando, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we do. Um, judicial races, I believe, are excluded from the abridged process. Um, I, I haven't seen us do that in the past. Is that correct? That's that's correct for for county and circuit level, um, where we just it's not ethical for, uh, for us to reward a judge based on how how they've been ruling, right? Because they're not passing policy and they have to stay objective. Um, but I, th I think uh, the question was more targeted at the retention of the Supreme Court and the retention of the uh, appellate courts, um, and we have endorsed in the past, um, um, and that's starts at the committee level, we treat that very much like our decisions around which ballot measures we endorse in and we don't. Um, and um, because we have so many people involved in the legal community, we, you know, we look at their ethics, we look at the demeanor on the bench and make a decision um, based on, on that. We do not blanket, we reject people that are appointed by a JNC, regardless of which governor was controlling that, that JNC, the Judicial Nominating Committee. Um, you know, for instance, um, Abby or Jonathan or Travis will know the the district number. But the, uh, in 2018, we did we did endorse to retain all of the judges at the appellate level um, um, because of the experience that people have had interacting with these judges over over the years. And I, I just want to add one more thing because there are judicial canons that apply to judges running for office. Um, there was a slide, you know, a few slides ago, which talked about what our criteria are for the, uh, for the different candidates who were interviewing on panels. And I wanted to point out that those, these uh, criteria don't, <clears throat> excuse me, don't apply to the judicial races. And we understand that um, the, specific, the, the delicate nature of those races with regard to the ethics that uh, judges have to abide by. So our questioning on the panels um, are geared toward judges and, and their experiences with the LGBTQ community and, and so on, and not necessarily how they would rule on LGBT issues. Uh, that's not something that we ask those judges because that would um, not be ethical for us to do so. And I do, I. And I, get, I think that, la that second question that Abby just read, I think the questioner was uh, asking for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> and one more thing I just want to add uh, also, I said it, when we do the panels and when we, especially for the judicial races, it doesn't matter if you're on the bench because you were elected or appointed by the governor, you still go through the same process. So if there's uh, any doubt about that, and that's an uh, issue, please uh, recognize that it is not an issue. 
Thank you. Um, got a good number of questions coming through. So the next one, uh, Rachel, thanks for submitting this question. And this is going to be for Dustin. It's a good sort of process oriented uh, question. And that is, what does the normal timeline look like from being able to advance from a panel interview to a committee vote to a board vote? Yeah, so it varies uh, depending on the number of races that we interview, right? Just because, um, like I said before, the, the committee and the board both work and volunteer so hard uh, that we don't want to make them come together for a conference call, you know, every week for every time we do a set of interviews. Um, so generally what the process looks like is that the questionnaires go out the Monday after qualifying ends and are due back 10 business days later, and then interviews begin that following week. Um, for this year's judicial races, it's, it's going to be uh, 15 business days instead of 10 before the interviews begin. And then we think we're going to get them done in four nights over the course of two weeks. So after the last set of interviews, uh, the committee will vote either on Friday the 20th or that next Monday, and then the board will vote soon after that. So in the shortest time sense, you're looking at five weeks. Uh, this one's going to be about six. Thanks, Justin. And so, yeah, the, 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 we're, I think we're getting started, right, in, in one or two weeks with our first set of, of, uh, of um, interviews that we're going to begin. And so the next question comes from Damien. And, it, and the question is, because we need to wait for filing before endorsing, so the, the, the filing, uh, the, the, the qualifying filing before we endorse, uh, what do you do when you have a candidate that needs saved support and obviously, um, we need to support the candidate. Is there anything that we can do uh, ahead of time? In other words, are there things that we can do to help these cases by short, but you know, short of an endorsement? Uh, anything else that can be done, or is there sort of a purity test here that, that takes place? How uh, how is our process impacting? Jonathan, do you want do you want to take that one? Sorry, I was trying to pull it up again so I could reread okay. it. Uh, sorry. It was about a prior to qualifying to help in the cases short of endorsing. That's pretty. I don't know. Maybe Justin's actually the right person to answer that. I, I just don't yeah. know. Justin. That, yeah, so, so the answer is uh, very, very little. Um, it's just if, if we're going to stick to our process, then folks need to go through the process. And once they get the endorsement, they get the support. You know, um, um, you know incumbents are, are, are a little bit at an advantage of that in that we're friends with them. They're in office, and we can invite them as an elected official to speak. Um, but generally, that's not the main consideration when we ask an elected to show up at an event or do a webinar with us, um, they just get that added bonus of already being in office. As individuals, um, it's, it's you know completely up to an individual's choice. And that's where the conflict of interest comes in. If you've already made up your mind and you're not waiting for the safe endorsement and you wanna go out and support somebody, power to you, just please don't send me an email asking to be on that panel, right? You've already made up your mind. We need to go through our steps. Um, and if it's somebody that that's, that strong and LGBT issues that you feel like you need to get involved before we endorse, 10 times out of, or 90 times out of 100 or 95 times out of 100, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna probably end up endorsing that person, but we need to stick to the process. And, and, Orlando, and, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. And one thing that I would just add on that is that save is whether we're gonna endorse you or not endorse you or whatever, we're always there for every candidate, a call, a, across the political and judicial spectrum as a resource. And we're always happy to work with everyone about what are the important issues to us and what, are, what issues is the LGBTQ community looking at this election cycle. And a lot of times candidates will come to us saying, you know, I just, I'm not well versed in some of these issues. Can you talk to me about them? And we do, we'll sit down, Orlando will sit down, I'll sit down, Justin will sit down with them and and educate them because there are a lot of well-meaning candidates uh, who really want to support the cause but they just don't know how so that's one 
area where whether we're endorsing you or not, um, you know, before filing or after filing deadline, we would love to help in any way we can in that respect. And Orlando, before we move on to the, before we move on uh -huh. to the next question, I wanted to go back to Rachel's question because you gave a really you guys gave a good answer about how the process advances from panel to the endorsement committee. But I think her question was actually, she said she's wondering about the advancement from panelist to endorsement committee member. So I think she's asking, um, what's the process ah, for going ah. from being a panelist to serving on the committee? Um, ah, in case that's her, in case that's her question, or in case anyone else has that question, it's not a clear cut thing. It's more just if people tend to be yeah. on a lot of panels over time, they enjoy it. Uh, we've noticed yeah. that you know, it's a good flow, then we encourage them to um, join the committee at that Absolutely. point, but there's no like track. Um, one thing I will plug in there in terms of, Orlando already talked about, you know, any of you signing up to be a panelist, we would love, the more the merrier, you don't have to have any sort of expertise in anything political, you don't have to know who the candidates are. Um, it's also not any big commitment. You can do it once and decide you don't like it. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, here in the short term, it's probably gonna be by Zoom. We're expecting some of them to be by Zoom. Usually we do it in person and we all sit down together. Um, and it's just, it's fun and it's interesting. And the more diversity we can get from the community, the better. Just my little Thank shame. you. Thank you for, for doing that. You know, it's just one of those instances where you look at a picture and one person sees one thing, another person sees another thing. So you help clarify that. Yeah, definitely. If you want to advance to becoming a member of, of a committee, just uh, raise your hand and we'll, we'll talk about what that involves and plug you in. And uh, if it doesn't work for you, then we, you can step back down and be a, a panelist. Sometimes it's just a matter of how, uh, you know, the kind of time commitment you can be able to make. Um, so the next question is, um, is I'll just answer the question. So there's a question about, who gets a questionnaire? Everybody who qualifies get the questionnaire. In incumbent races, we and we make a decision to to want to get behind the incumbent that we send them the application questionnaire application, and that's for the incumbent races where we where we feel like that person has continued to be supportive of us on policy and the community, and there's been really no hiccup in terms of their their tenure. So that's uh that's how those two uh, differ. Uh, Unless the, uh, the one have... caveat, sorry, Orlando, the one caveat to that is they do the, they get the questionnaire, but if there's any issues with the questionnaire or the committee deems the other, you know, candidate in the race to be, you know, a really strong advocate too, then this is not an automatic thing. Um, then there is an opportunity to send a questionnaire to everyone to, to convene a panel and all of that. So just wanted to make that clear. Absolutely. Um, I want to put another emphasis, and that is that this process, the endorsement process, is an education process. Candidates, before uh, all of this starts, like Jonathan said, they call us up and they tell us, tell me what, you know, conversion therapy is. Tell me what, you know, uh, what, what matters for the community. So we do this all the time and, and uh, we really encourage everybody to continue to do it. You've got some great questions. I'm gonna power through the next three, qu three questions so that we can get uh, to the end of this and we won't take up much more of your time. We really appreciate how productive this has been, but these are really uh, questions from people who are new to the process. There's three of these, but I'll take one really quick and I'll give this one to anybody that wants to answer. And that is that there's a question about what happens when a, when a candidate is supportive of the community, does well in the interview process, but there's a known um, uh, deficit financially in their campaign. How do we weigh that against everything else? And so. I'll turn to the panel and to Dustin to be able to provide some, some color to that conversation. Um, and then we can go to these other uh, last questions. I mean, I can answer. Um, it, it's kind of up to the panel. I mean, we don't really decide on the committee or the board level. It's really gonna be up to the panel that interviews the candidates about what are the important factors in that race and how strong the candidate is. And then the panel makes the recommendation to the committee. Um, I will say, having been on countless panels before, viability of a campaign is really, really important. Because uh, save, you know, as save, we don't want to be endorsing a candidate who just has no chance whatsoever. Um, and so, you know, it's really up to the panel and and who's on the panel to decide. I also want to add that you know the economic. Um, uh, 
portion of this is important, but it's not the only function of it. Viability is, is, is not strictly about money. Uh, you know, having a path to success is not strictly about money because we have endorsed candidates in the past who may not have had as much uh, money in the bank as their opponent, but they did, they did have a viable path to victory. So that is one of the things that the panel uh, looks uh, at when they're trying to endorse and they make the recommendations. So, you know, that isn't, uh, you know, that's something that is considered, but that uh, will not keep a person from being endorsed. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, and I love this, this is from somebody who signed up to be a first time uh, panelist. Is there anything that a panelist can begin to do now to prepare? Uh, I can answer that. Um, no, there's nothing you need to prepare to do to prepare. Um, people come in and off all the time who've never done it before. It's not stressful. It's not, well, maybe it's a, it's a little exciting when you first ask your first question, I guess, of a candidate. But it's, it's very low key. If you're nervous about it or you just want to know how it's going to go, you can call me or reach out to, you know, Justin or, or Orlando just to get a sense of it. But there's like, like Justin said, there's a 30 minute window after you arrive, assuming you arrive on time, please arrive on time. Um, there's a window in there where whoever's chairing that particular panel, it'll probably be somebody from the committee. Not necessarily me, but, you know, it could be Jonathan or, or somebody else from that committee list that you saw. Um, they'll kind of explain how the process is going to go. So um, yep. it's an easy thing to participate in. Yeah, yep. we will guide you. We'll really, we'll really take care of you through the process. Jonathan? Yeah, no, it, it, as if you want, if, once you get the list of the candidates who you're going to be interviewing, if you want to look them up, you Google them, you take a look at uh, the, the, the political Wikipedia thing. And, you know, the more information you know, the better, but you can, you know, there's certainly many people who go in not knowing anything about it. And, um, you know, they really listen to the candidates and make their decision. So there's really not much you need to do. The only other yeah. thing that I would add is that just make sure that uh, before you start to serve on a panel that there are no conflicts of interest. Uh, speak up. Uh, if, you know, you suddenly decide, uh, find yourself on a panel where, you know, something types and say, hey, I do have a conflict of interest. The thing, the time to do it is before the panel starts because we don't want uh, to tank the process. We want to keep everybody on the same board and we don't want the person who's being interviewed to be at a disadvantage uh, or to have their counterparts at a disadvantage because, you know, someone didn't speak up. So that would be uh, the thing that I would just uh, add on to that. Cool. Um, thank you for that. And um, so the next question is about, uh, so I'm just going to read it. How in need are you of additional panelists and what are the quali qualifications to get on board? So I think we just talked about the qualifications. Our need for panelists is great. We always need more people to sign up because given the number of races that we're doing this year, um, we're, we're going to go through a lot. And um, as we mentioned, if you sign up for a uh, uh, a night of a race, you're going to interview all the candidates. So the, the, the decision making is done entirely for the race. Um, and I'll add to this, and that is to say to the conversation that was held earlier, um, arrive early because part of what happens at the beginning of the panel, let's say that we're going to have a discussion about members that are running for a state race. So one of the questions that will, or one of some of the information that we'll say is that we'll share with the panel some of the policy issues that are important for this particular race. So we'll highlight that there's a need for us to pass a statewide ban on conversion therapy. We'll, we'll highlight that there's a need to pass a, a non-discrimination uh, uh, ordinance at the, or, or law at the state level. So we'll do this and we'll cover those policy pieces to give you the briefing so that when you go into those interviews, you're kind of focused on the policy pieces. Um, the person also added that, you know, he has uh, politically informed friends who are interested they know a little bit about SAVE and also some of them, uh, other than being voters, might want to be involved. I'll say this, and that is that uh, SAVE welcomes everybody. And um, I always like to hear uh, people out of the street, particularly straight people, who always say to me, hey, I love SAVE. I'm involved in the, in the endorsement process. And so one might think that even members of the straight community wouldn't be involved uh, with the LGBT community, but we welcome everybody. So uh, people of all levels of activism, people who uh, identifying the entire spectrum of LGBT Q&A are welcome and so everybody can come in, we bring them into the fold. I love to hear from people when they tell us that their activism 
uh, started with SAVE because they got involved uh, by being on a panel. Um, does anybody else want to add to that? Okay, two more questions. So, hi, Demi. So, Demi's asking, when do you generally publish endorsements? Uh, Dustin, you want to talk about when we publish them in terms of our timeline? I think you answered that a while ago. Yeah, the, 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 the announcement generally comes out about 48 hours after the, the board vote, sometimes a little bit less, depending on how fast we can get the graphics together. And this is going to be done in, in waves. Um, so our congressional endorsements will probably come out around May 14th, May 15th. The judicial endorsements are going to come out around <clears throat> May 25th or 26th. Um, and then state level endorsements are going to be in, in two waves where we prioritize state level and, and county commission and, and August elections, right? We're going to prioritize those for early June. Um, but then any of the other state races that we get through that we interview before the August primary, we'll publish those in the batch uh, in, in late in late July. Awesome. Thank you. That's helpful. So the last question it came through is um, one of the persons who's asking a question is an attorney and works for a law firm and they've held uh, reception in the past for judges. Um, and so they want to know, is that, consider, uh, is that considered uh, a conflict of interest and how would they manage that to be able to participate as a panelist? I can answer that, Orlando. Um, yeah, the question says, it says, if my firm has had a judicial reception for a sitting, mm -hmm. a particular sitting judge, would I be excluded from a panelist for that judge? I think um, the answer is maybe. If, certainly, if you've personally donated, yes. If you've made up your mind about supporting that candidate, yes. If you have a small law firm and the, the firm itself donating is essentially you donating, you know, because you're a partner and there's three partners, I would think that probably from an appearance of impropriety might look like you've donated to the candidates. I think you'd probably be excluded for that reason. Uh, if you're part of a big firm and you didn't attend this event, it just happens to be that somebody else from your firm invited a judge in and some other people attended and just happened to be, you know, in your office or another office of your law firm. Uh, I think we could talk about that and kind of take that on a case by case basis. The, the conflict issues tend to be case by case, but really what we prefer is just find some panel. There's so many panels to sit on, find some where that's not a, not a close call. And the best thing with, with conflicts is if you have any question or doubt, bring it to Abby's attention uh, as the chair of the endorsement committee or Justin's attention, they'll talk about it. Any doubt whatsoever, it's best, you know, best to err on the side of caution and, uh, and talk about it instead of just, you know, the last thing we want is it to come up later for whatever reason. And it's, you know, at that point, you've already been on the panel. Absolutely. Um, so we've come to the end of the webinar. Uh, I want to thank Justin, Abby, and Carlos. There's one more, there's one more question. Ah, oh, there's another one that came through. Um, what do you do for smaller municipal council races? I mean, I can answer that. It's, it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, and we have a different questionnaire because our questionnaires are tailored to the types of races that it is. Um, different issues obviously are addressed at the local level versus the state legislature, for example. But we go through the same process. We have panels. Um, yeah, we, treat, we take those, those, case, those races very seriously. We don't necessarily cover every single town's race for every single position. Um, that's elected. We have limited staff resources, but to the extent we're, you know, trying to get legislation through in a particular um, city or county, we absolutely hold mm -hmm. panels for those, just the same as we do for the others. Right. Yeah, Thank and you. especially in, in, that last question. in an even number election year, there's something like 190 nonpartisan municipal elected officials in the, the county of Miami-Dade. Um, when you're not falling on a November election date, like the 18 cities are that, that are doing it this year, um, you know, we, we generally engage in the vast majority of those races. Um, you know, and this year, it just matters how many can get through and how fast we can get through them. Uh, if there is somebody that's running for a municipal race uh, and is very interested in our endorsement, if at all possible, we do open up the process um, that sometimes turns out in their favor and sometimes we endorse, endorse their opponent. Uh, it just depends on what, what race it is and, and who's applying. Thank you, that's helpful. 
Um, so I think we've exhausted the questions. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for the webinar. Big thanks to Justin, Abby, Provis, and Jonathan. Also members of the audience, thank you for hanging on and, and, and bringing up those really thoughtful questions. We appreciate all of your support. Sign on to be panelists. We're going to have more than 90 interviews taking place this year. And also stay tuned for our speaker series. Next week we have three uh, uh, series taking place, all to be able to highlight the candidates uh, that are going to be part of the Miami-Dade uh, County mayoral election. And just like the questionnaires, we sent out an invitation to everybody to be a part of the, the series. Only three responded. And so already this is demonstrating to you uh, which kind of candidates want our support, which ones do not want our support. So we have Xavier Suarez on Monday, May 4th at 6 p.m. We have Commissioner Daniela Levine Cava on Thursday, May 7th at 6 p.m. And then we're gonna have former Mayor, former mayor Alex Finales on Friday, May 8th at 6 p.m. And uh, we've come to the end. So everybody please take good care and have a great week. Good night.